we will be exploring the structural differences between these arteries and veins. And just like everything else in the body, the structure really does determine the function. So here we go. Starting with the aorta and going out into the capillary beds and then on a return trip, which we call venous return, right? Venous is another uh, derivation of the word vein and return, meaning it's going back to the heart. So venous return comes back through these blue vessels. You know, we're scientists, we love to categorize everything. So look at this. We look at the structure of these large conducting arteries, and we know that they are subject to some of the highest blood pressures in the body. So as we talked about in the first video, there's a lot of elastin, a special elastic protein, uh, and then it's sort of woven through all of this smooth muscle. When we move down the line and into these smaller medium arteries, sometimes called distributing arteries, we see that there's less elastin. There is still a significant amount of smooth muscle though. Do you remember why? Why should an artery have muscle in it? For vasoconstriction, of course. One of the most important mechanisms by which your body regulates your blood pressure is to tighten the arteries, causing the decrease in the size of the lumen and an increase in blood pressure. This has happened to all of us, right? You stand up too quickly, you feel a bit lightheaded, maybe your vision starts to go tunnel mode, but you don't pass out. Your body responds to that drop in blood pressure and you begin to feel more normal again, even within just a few seconds. What you can't feel is the tensing, the vasoconstriction that occurs in these muscular arteries, including the large, the medium, and then these ones too, the arterioles. Let me give you a perspective. This is what we're talking about. These large muscular arteries are the biggest ones, like the aorta and the common iliacs and the brachiocephalic. The medium and distributing arteries might be something a bit smaller, like this radial artery here or this one here called the lateral femoral cutaneous. We can't actually see anything a bit smaller than that on this picture, but you'd have to imagine that if we could follow these tiniest of arteries down, we would eventually get to something that looks like this, right? These are the arterioles, and remember they're the last arteries before the capillary bed or capillary network. So looking at the structure of the arteriole here, On slide number 14, we can see that it does have a small amount of muscular tissue, relatively thick uh, adventitia yet at this point, and of course endothelium with the basement membrane. We get into the capillaries, look at what we find, none of those other peripheral tissues. It's only endothelium and basement membrane. Do you remember why? It's because capillaries are the only vessels permeable enough to allow for gaseous and nutrient exchange. And so as strange as it sounds, every cubic millimeter of your body has capillary beds in it, with a few rare exceptions. Cartilage, for example, is avascular. But everything else, all of your skin, all of your muscle, uh, our fat and our nervous tissue, all of those metabolically active tissues, glands, and your liver, and your stomach, and your uterus, they are all just packed with these microscopic capillary beds. This is really where the action happens. Nutrients and oxygen are delivered through the very leaky capillary wall to the tissues. And carbon dioxide and wastes are brought into the blood and then through venous return, they're brought back to the heart. Okay, when we get on the other side of the capillary bed, remember we see these little vessels called venules. These ones here, which collect the venous blood from the capillary bed and then begin that return trip. These smallest veins are called venules. And we can see here now in a little bit uh, different detail down here on slide number 20, that the venules also have, uh, where'd they go? Uh, 
Well, here we see the uh, venules uh, back on this slide here. A very small amount of muscular tissue. Uh, the muscle builds up as we go back in through the veins. So there can also be venous vasoconstriction and vasodilation. What do you see about the size of the lumen? Looking back and forth, comparing these arteries to veins. Generally speaking, the lumen is larger in the veins, and that's significant. That helps the blood pressure on the venous return trip to be much lower. Um, the reason for that, I think, is that our veins are much more superficial. If you've ever cut yourself in the kitchen or in an accident, 99% uh, of the time, these nicks and scratches cut into venous blood, which drips or oozes if you have a wound. The arteries tend to be much deeper, and it's because they have much higher blood pressure. And so if you've ever had the opportunity to see an arterial bleed, you know that it is a spurting wound because of that very high blood pressure. So anyway, there are these two sort of forces of natural selection at play here. Uh, we want there to be significant blood pressure, but we don't want to bleed to death. And so uh, structurally, evolution sculpted us so that our arteries are better protected, they're deeper, and that the veins are closer to the periphery. Now here's the downside. As we look at this uh, graph right here, what we see is that the blood pressure really falls as we move away from the heart. So on this graph we read the pressure, on the vertical axis, and then this would be where the heart is, the aorta, and then as we branch into the brachiocephalic and then down into the capillary beds and then eventually on the venous return. So look at this. Look at how high the blood pressure is immediately downstream from the aortic valve. The rising and falling of this blue line represents the ejection phase of the cardiac cycle, right? Systole, which is where we get this word, systolic, means contraction. And so when the powerful left ventricle contracts, it sends blood out into the systemic circuit, and the blood pressure peaks right about here. This is, of course, a textbook value. It doesn't always come out this way, but we see a 120 over 80. That top number represents the highest that the blood pressure goes as the blood is being ejected from the left ventricle. Then, in between cardiac cycles, during ventricular diastole, the blood pressure drops. It never drops to zero unless you only have one heartbeat, right? Then eventually that pressure will drop. What happens is when we get to the bottom, then we reach the next phase, the next cardiac cycle, and the next bolus of blood moving up the stream, and so the pressure goes right back up again. At the bottom of that trough, that represents the relaxation phase of the ventricle, which we call diastole, and that's where we get this word diastolic. So undoubtedly you've heard these terms before. The 120 over 80 is the systolic pressure over diastolic pressure. We'll talk much more about that in just a few minutes, but I want you to see that the blood pressure in the veins is ridiculously low. Look at this. There is actually a little bit of negative pressure just before we go into the heart because of the sort of sucking action of that muscular pump. But what we see here is that capillaries, because they're so fragile, they, they wouldn't be able to stand such high pressure. And the veins have such low blood pressure that in an upright position, venous return becomes difficult because gravity is pulling the blood down and the blood pressure in the veins is so low, it can barely overcome gravity. Okay, so here's an important structure function connection. If we look here, we see that these veins have valves. Just like the valves of the heart, they prevent backflow. And so as I'm walking around, blood is sort of being pushed from one lock to the next. If you think of that, this sort of looks like uh, the locks that a ship would go through and then get moved up to the next step. So in sort of a strange way, that's how this works. These valves are pushed open, especially when we contract our muscles like we do when we walk 
or do yoga or exercise of any kind. And then the blood can't go back. So when you take your next step, the valves open and it pushes up into the next one. And so it is in this manner that venous blood is able to sort of climb the ladder all the way up against gravity until the pressure is so low here in the inferior vena cava or superior vena cava that the blood sort of just gets sucked back in. All of this is, of course, driven by the pressure of the heart. Okay. Uh, we talked about these. Here's a really important physiological connection. Remember the fight or flight response, this so-called sympathetic effect? Yeah, if you're in an emergency setting or a stressful situation, although you don't intend for it to happen, it's an involuntary response that your sympathetic nerve fibers will innervate the muscular tissue and cause a decrease in the size of the lumen, constriction, right? Vaso means blood vessel, so vasoconstriction means to squeeze the artery. Now there are a few places in the body where the rest and digest division, which we call the parasympathetic, also innervates blood vessels. And look at this, in our erectile tissues, in the penis and clitoris. So when one is sexually aroused, even if one does not intend for it to happen, this involuntary response sends more blood to the genitals. And there can be sympathetic fibers which sort of prevent the blood from leaving and so blood flows in and it can't get out and that's what results in this engorgement of these erectile tissues. As we'll see in just a little bit, some blood vessels are also innervated with sensory fibers so that our body has a way of monitoring our blood pressure and depending on activity or position, we can then make minor adjustments to try to maintain normal blood pressure. Look at this, leading cause of death in America, ladies and gentlemen, bacon, saturated fat, like we find in bacon and lard and uh, good corn-fed pork chops and steak. Any of these saturated fats have the ability to begin to clog our arteries with fat. Now the relationship isn't quite as direct as you might think, okay? This isn't bacon fat in my vessels. It's fat from my diet that has gone through my liver and become something else, something we call LDL cholesterol, low density lipoprotein. Please keep in mind that not all cholesterol is equal. And so I think from what we may have heard in the media or from what we may have heard as it relates to cardiovascular disease, when I say cholesterol, you probably have a negative emotion, but it's an issue of too much of a good thing. Here's what I mean. Everyone needs cholesterol. Cholesterol plays a very important role in our cell wall and in our ability to make hormones like steroids. The issue is in a modern American diet, we eat so much more saturated fat than our bodies were ever designed for that our liver begins to try to get rid of it, try to store it somewhere. And so this is what happens. The LDL cholesterol begins to build up. Now notice that it's not actually in the lumen, right? This isn't like a residue in a pipe building up. It is underneath the endothelium, right? This is called a subendothelial plaque. And this is the condition, atherosclerosis. Athero means fatty plaque. Sclerosis means uh, like a hardening. And so over here, in this part of the vessel, there really is no evidence of atherosclerosis. And so the lumen is, say, one centimeter. But down here, look at how much of that is blocked. This is really where the lumen should be. I'd say this vessel is something like 60% occluded. Now, this is very dangerous for two reasons. One, the amount of blood flowing through this narrowing is diminished. And so any tissue downstream, like heart muscle or 
nervous tissue in our brain. Any of that tissue that is deprived of oxygen could suffer pain, diminished function, ultimately cell death. The other significant risk here is that when the blood flows through this opening, it flows in a very smooth pattern called laminar flow. And when it comes through this narrowing, it begins to get stirred up and sped up, sort of a hissing sound. And this is created by turbulence. So let's look at those ideas right here. The top image shows us what we call laminar flow. And the way to read this and visualize it is this is sort of like a stream. If you've ever stood on the top of a bridge and looked down at the river, generally speaking, the water in the middle of the river is moving fastest and the water closest to the shore is moving more slowly. It's really all about friction, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as the water moves by the rocks and sand and rubs against those, there is some friction, and so it slows down the flow. But this layer, which is buffered by that one, has less resistance, and so it flows a bit more quickly, so on and so forth. So what we see here is at the center of a blood vessel, we have really fast and efficient movement, and then as we move closer to the edge, it just slows down a little bit. The point is, all of the fluid is moving in the same direction. The word lamina really means layers, and so that represents these concentric uh, layers of fluid that are moving together. Look at how different turbulence looks. This is getting stirred up and tossed around, and we have blood moving in random directions. Uh, the risk here is that a platelet or two might get bumped into each other because of this turbulence or get slammed against the wall a little too firmly. And then we see a poof, a little platelet activation. And then poof, 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 like popcorn, pretty soon they're all going off. And so a constriction like this caused by atherosclerotic plaque creates the opportunity for blood clots and then that could cut off the blood flow or send a clot somewhere that we don't want it, like the lungs or the heart or the brain. As if this weren't confusing enough, there's another condition that has almost the same name. It's not atherosclerosis, it's arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. And this is a, a bit more of a general term uh, for degenerative changes. Uh, we need these vessels to be very elastic and when they begin to harden, it can lead to blood pressure problems, it can lead to all kinds of issues where your blood isn't able to flow or you're uh, perfusing in an improper way. So, arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis is fatty plaque accumulation within the arteries. Uh, arteriosclerosis certainly has some genetic familial tendencies, but cigarette smoking is probably the best way to harden your arteries at an accelerated rate. Also genetic factors here uh, for atherosclerosis, but much more so correlated with diet. So if you want to lower your atherosclerosis, you should adopt a Mediterranean diet. Low carb, lots of fish, lots of omega-3 fatty acids and olive oil, nuts and a small amount of red wine seems to be, based on current research, the best diet for that one. Um, anyway, we'll talk a lot more about that in our digestive chapter. When we come back for our next video, we'll pick right up here at the dynamics of blood flow circulation.